you would tonight take your Bibles and go with me to the book of John, John chapter 14. I feel led of the Lord to share with you a passage of Scripture. It's very familiar, something I hope will be an encouragement and help to you. I'm praying for our community and praying for even folks in my family and folks dealing with uh, this great loss this week. And I want to be praying and considerate of the family and so many things going on this week, praying for Lucas's family and asking you to encourage and pray and lift them up to the Lord as much as possible. I want to share a passage of Scripture with you that its intention was originally, as spoken by the Lord Jesus, to encourage His disciples. You turn to John chapter 14, and Jesus knows that in the very, very near future, as He speaks to His disciples, a huge part of their life is going to be missing very quickly. It's Himself. Jesus, soon after John 14, will go to the cross. As Jesus looks at the lives and considers the hearts and emotions and needs of his disciples, he gives them John chapter 14. He says, here's something I want to help you with, guys. I want to encourage you. He says it like this, John chapter 14, beginning in verse number 1. We'll read the first 19 verses. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also." The Bible says in verse number 16, I will pray the Father, he shall give you another comforter. Verse number 18, the Bible says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you comfortless. Quite frankly, you deal with folks in times of great loss. And I often thought as a very young preacher, I thought I had to know what to say. The longer I've been around, I found out I don't have to know what to say. As a matter of fact, I don't know what to say. Uh, I don't think I know what to say. Uh, Normally, I say, I'm sorry. I'm praying for you. I don't understand. But I can promise you this. In your season and moments and times of deepest loss, God from heaven, using His own dear Son, as the mouthpiece has promised you this, you don't have to be troubled. Rest in God. He says this, I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you comfortless. 
He says, I'm going to give you something that will comfort you. And you come to this passage of Scripture, and I can't help but look around. When I see a statement like, I will not leave you comfortless, I can't help but look around in the Scripture to see where the comfort is because I know it's there, and God has left it for us. He says, I won't leave you comfortless. We understand that the comforter in the Scripture is the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost is present with us. He's promised he'd never leave us nor forsake us. God's with us. Isn't it wonderful to know God's with us? He says this, not only does he leave us God, which is wonderful, that's the most important part. He says, I won't leave you comfortless. He says, I'm going to give you comfort. Comfort is not found in the absence of trouble, but in the presence and promises of God. I want to show you some comforts that God gives us here in this passage of Scripture. I will not leave you comfortless. The first comfort is this, number one, God promises us heaven, heaven. Uh, the Bible says in verse number one, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Folks, I want you to know something. God has promised us the comfort of heaven. Heaven is a real place. Heaven's a real place. Heaven, as real as this pulpit, is wood. As real as this skin is real. As real as I'm standing here today, heaven is that real. Heaven's a real place. Now, it's easy, and I get this way often because I put a lot of stock in this world. I'll just be quite frank with you. I love my wife. I love spending time with her. I love my boys. I love the privilege that I have, and I want to treasure. And in the last couple of days, I've, I've uh, more very specifically treasured the moments that I get to spend with my children. I love them. I love my family. I love my church. I love my community. I love my job. I love what God's given me to do. I don't dread a day of my life. I'm thankful for the opportunity to get up. I love life, and I put a lot of stock in it. I'm working hard at it. But you all know something? My life is about this long. It's short. I've used up about half of it already. It's real short. But eternity is real long. And folks, I want you to know something. The hurts of today are real. I do not discredit them. The hurts of today are real. But the glories of eternity are real also. And the short time that we suffer and we have on this earth will be represented forever in heaven. And we've got the promise of heaven, the glory of God, the presence of God. And folks, I want you to know something. The only thing we have is not these few days here on earth. As a matter of fact, we have something far greater, exceeding greater, beyond the grave. Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, Look, boys, you're going to be disappointed. You've got in your heart that I might set up a kingdom and we might have an opportunity to do some ruling and reigning here on earth right now. He says, but the truth of the matter is, in just a few days I'm going to go to the cross and I'm not going to be with you anymore. I'm going to go to heaven to be with my Father. But I'm, if, I go to he, if I go, I'm going to prepare a place for you also. And we're going to have an, a place in heaven forever. Folks, I want you to know something. When Jesus looked at his disciples and says, I won't leave you comfortless, one of his comforts was heaven. We have the promise if we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ that we will spend eternity together in heaven. Heaven's real. Heaven is a comfort. Here's the second promise. The second promise, the second comfort that Jesus gives us past the Scripture is the promise of His return. Uh, the promise of His return. The Bible says in verse 3, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. I believe the Bible teaches plainly the rapture of the church. There's coming a day when the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will rise, and then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Jesus is coming again. It's wonderful. And as a young man, I'll just tell you, there are days that I want to live a little longer and I have to, I think, you know, maybe, Lord Terry, you're coming just a little bit longer. And that's not the, that's not the most spiritual thing to say, but it's just true sometimes. But I had a conversation with a man that I love dearly just a, a few days before my wife and I would be married. 
five of our very best friends, five dear friends of ours, uh, four of our four of the five were to be in our wedding. Just a week before we were to be married, five of our friends were tragically killed in a car accident. They were a, a quartet, singing, traveling, representing the Lord, representing Crown College. And just a few days before we got married, they were all five tragically killed in a car accident. It was awful. Our hearts were broken. And uh, I just can have to give God the glory and praise for helping us through that thing. I'm good friends with the father of one of my friends that was killed that day. And we've spent lots of time together through the years and talked often. And one day he told me something that helped me th put the coming of Christ in perspective for someone who has suffered loss. He said, you know, Cody, he said, I wake up every day hoping that Jesus will come again. I said, that's wonderful. I said, I said tell me about that because I want to know. Because I, I, that's not my sentiment always. He said, he said, you know what? It's just so exciting for me. I get up every day and I think this could be the day that Jesus comes back. Because I know that this day, any day, every day, could be the day that I get to see Aaron again. The day that I get to be reunited with my son. He says, I anticipate with such anticipation the coming of the Lord. Jesus is coming again. And uh, folks, I want you to know something. We've suffered loss here on earth. You have folks who've gone on before you. You know, today could be that great reunion day. If God sees fit to do that, hallelujah. If he sees fit to tarry his coming, praise his name. He's given other folks opportunities to get saved. But we've got heaven to look forward to. He says, I will not leave you comfortless. He gives us the comfort of heaven, the comfort of his return. Number three, he gives us the comfort of answered prayer. The comfort of answered prayer. The Bible says in verse 13, Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, what does the Lord Jesus say to his disciples? He says, look guys, he says, you have the opportunity to commune with God. You don't have to understand everything, and you won't understand everything, but you have the opportunity to talk to God about it, and God is going to give you comfort. God is going to give you peace. You're never alone. In your time of great distress, go to the Lord. When my heart is overwhelmed within me, the Bible teaches that we go to the rock, that rock of our salvation. We go to the Lord. He says, I won't leave you coming. He says, I'll give you the promise of answered prayer. Look what the fourth one is. The promise of His presence. The Bible says in verse number 17, Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive... Because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. God says, I won't leave you comfortless. He says, I promise my presence. I don't know about you, but there are moments in my life and when I think it'd be good to be in heaven today. Uh, there's some folks I know that think of it more often. Boy, wouldn't it be a joy to be in heaven and, uh, and I look forward to heaven. I really do. And what a wonderful promise. But you know something that God's promised us? For the days that we live on this earth, that we yearn to be in heaven but can't, God has promised that he has sent heaven to us. God has sent heaven to us. Folks, I want you to know something, that we can get a little taste of heaven every moment of every day when we live in the conscious presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says... He dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Folks, for the days of our journey in this life, God's promised to be right with us. He's with us. Heaven has come to us. And we can rest in the fact that I'm never alone. God is with me. I don't face any burden apart from the presence and power and blessing of God. He says, be comforted. Be comforted. Heaven has come to you. Look at the last thing, number five. I will not leave you comfortless. The Bible says this in verse 19, Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. What's the promise? Because Jesus Christ 
is alive forevermore. We have the promise that we will live also. We have everlasting life. We have the promise of eternal life. Eternal life. It begins at the moment we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, our Savior. We have the promise of everlasting life. He says, because I live, ye shall live also. Oh, folks, when we start to get burdened down with everything that's going on in this world, may we go to God's Word. You know that God's Word, the Bible says, is like a hammer. And God's Word is like a consuming fire. I read this story today, and it really helped me. It encouraged me. I hope it will encourage you. It comes from the pages of the Pilgrim's Progress written by John Bunyan. And Christian is the main character in Pilgrim's Progress, and Christian's on a journey through life, and he meets up with this guy named Interpreter. They walk into a room, and as they walk into the room, there's a wall with a great fire going, like a fireplace. Just to the side of the fire, there's a man dressed all in black, pouring buckets of water on the fire. But all the while, the fire continues to blaze and to blaze greater. Christian says to interpreter, what does this mean? Interpreter says, that's the devil trying to quench the spirit of God's people. Oh, that's bad. Interpreter says, no way. Interpreter leads Christian to the, around to the other side of the wall. The opposite side of where the devil is trying to quench the fire and the spirit of God's people. And there's God with fresh oil, fanning the fire, feeding his people, strengthening the fire. And the devil can quench, the devil can quench, the devil can quench. But all the while, God's pouring fresh oil on his people. That flammable substance that keeps us on the winning side, that flammable substance that keeps us burning bright for God and his glory is the fire of God's word. And we can rest in it. He says, be comforted. Heaven is our home. Heaven's real. Eternity is real. Life is short. Eternity is long. Live for Jesus today. Rejoice in the blessings of God for all of eternity. We hurt. And we sorrow, it's true. And you should. I've sat in front of my computer and wept. With sorrow for this precious family. For the last couple of days. But the Bible says that we sorrow not as those which have no hope. We sorrow, we do. But our sorrow has such a has a certain sweetness about it because uh, the sorrow of death for the child of God is not final. It's not over. We take our bodies off like taking off a piece of clothing. We go to be with the Lord. We have the promise of everlasting life through Him. Oh, may God comfort us. We need His help. The oil that will flame the fire of your soul God's word. Rest in these promises. Heaven. Rest in these promises. Jesus is coming again. Rest in these promises. God will hear and answer your prayers. Rest in these promises. He's with you. Heaven has come to us. God is with you. He's going to help you. Rest in this promise. We have everlasting life. Because Jesus lives, you can live also. Let's pray.